Who are you? That's a question that people have been asking for centuries. They've been asking it of themselves. They've been asking it of other people. Who are you? It's a question that's led to many deep discussions. It's a, it's a question that has led to incalculable hours of contemplation and reflection. It is a question that has troubled many throughout the years. And it is a question that is often incorrectly answered by many people. Who are you is a question associated with identity. And in the culture that we find ourselves living in today, identity is often at the forefront of conversations. It's at the forefront of various discussions. For these reasons, this question of who are you is a very personal question. But it is a question that all of us have asked ourselves more than once in our lives, whether we were cognizant of it or not. We have asked this question of ourselves at different points in different times. But how we answer that question has a direct impact, a direct effect on how we live as individuals in this world. How we answer that question of who are you has a direct effect on how we live our daily lives. In today's culture, we find that one has a myriad of ways in order to identify themselves. However, it's not a new phenomenon. We see it as new, but it's not new. People throughout the centuries have had a myriad of ways to identify themselves or to ascribe an identity to themselves. But what has changed more so in the last 10 or 15 years within the culture itself is this broader acceptance of one's personal identification that they have given to themselves. In other words, the culture has become more accepting of one's own self-ascribed identity. Most of us are familiar with these changes in the culture. We've seen it in a ver various number of ways, and we've likely read articles about it. We've heard commentary on it. We, we know that this change has come about. And this topic garners more and more attention every day, it seems. And while it's true that an individual can ascribe an identity to themselves, that doesn't mean that the identity they ascribe to themselves is a true identity. I could identify myself as a physicist after reading several books on physics, but that would not be a true identity. I could play golf from time to time, and I can identify as a good golfer, but my scorecard is going to reveal that's not a true identity of me. Anyone can ascribe an identity, that, an identity to themselves. Anyone can, can say they are something, but that doesn't make it true. But how we identify ourselves, who we say that we are, has an effect on how we live. But something we always need to keep in mind is there's always a standard, there's always a rule, there's always a measure that will determine whether something is or is not true. And there's one standard that trumps all other standards. There's the standard that all standards within this life, within this world, are set against, and that standard is God and his word. And when we come to the scriptures, we find that everyone does indeed have an identity. Every individual has an identity that is very real, that is very true. And we come to the scriptures, and we find that despite who we might say we are, in reality, we are who God says we are. And not only that, we are what God says we are. We can say we are a lot of things in this life, but ultimately we are who God says we are. For many, that's an uncomfortable reality. So they run from what God has said in his word. They run from God in general. Yet for many, there is great comfort in this because when we come to the scriptures, the believer in Jesus Christ finds that their identity is rooted in Jesus. The believer finds that they are forgiven. They find that they belong to God. They are one of his own. They have been adopted into the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ. They're free from the rule and control of sin in their lives. They, are, they have a living and eternal hope that is very real, that is very present in their lives. They have spiritual life and so much more. However, there is one aspect of the Christian identity that many believers lose sight of or think little of throughout the course of their lives, and it is the reality that in and through Jesus Christ, 
the believer is spiritually complete. In and through faith in Christ and Christ alone, the believer in Christ is spiritually complete. We saw this in our time together last week as we looked at chapter 2 in Colossians. The believer in Jesus is spiritually complete because our faith, our trust, is in the one who has done all that needed to be done in order for us to have a right relationship with God. All we must do is believe. All we must do is trust in Jesus, believing that he lived, that he died on the cross to, to pay the penalty for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised to life on the third day. That is all one must do, all one must believe, in order for them to have eternal life and to become a new creation in and through Christ. They must simply trust in Jesus. And I come back to this reality again this week, because if we do not rightly recognize and understand as Christians, as followers of Christ, who we are in Jesus and what we are in Jesus, fully forgiven, spiritually complete in Christ and through Christ, then we may not respond as we should when others say there is more that we need to do in order to be sure that we are indeed right with God. We may not respond as we should when others come against us with some sort of judgment or condemnation and say that we don't know all that we need to know in order to be saved. If we do not rightly understand who we are in and through Jesus, we may even find ourselves adopting religious practices that have no spiritual benefit trying to mature in the faith through the rules and practices of others when we should be pursuing the things of God wholeheartedly. Today we're going to see how Paul addressed this with the Colossians. So if you would turn with me to Colossians chapter 2 again. We'll pick up where we left off last week, finish out through chapter 2 today. I was thinking we'd possibly make it into chapter 3, but we won't. We'll, we'll end off at the end of chapter 2. But Colossians chapter 2, picking up in verse 15. If you don't have a copy of the scriptures, uh, it, you, there's a copy of the scriptures in front of you. Um, if you don't own a copy of the scriptures, please feel free to take that copy home with you. Beginning in verse 15, we read, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism, and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Everything you and I believe about Jesus Christ, everything you and I believe about the Christian life and how we are to live the Christian life must be rooted in what God has revealed through his Son and what God has revealed through his Word. Because spiritual life and spiritual truth is rooted in God and God alone. It is rooted in God and is found in his word. Spiritual truth is not rooted in the traditions of men. Spiritual truth is not rooted in the wisdom of men, but solely in God and what he has revealed to us. The traditions and wisdom of men abound. It's nothing new. They have been, the, the wisdom and traditions of men have abounded for centuries. And over the past few weeks, we have noticed that the traditions of two main groups that were outside of the Christian faith were very prominent when Paul wrote to the Colossians. We've seen the, these teachings that Paul addressed that were put forward by both the Judaizers and the Gnostics. And so prevalent and enticing was their teaching, Paul devoted nearly half of this letter to refuting and standing against the teachings of the Judaizers and the Gnostics. Because Paul knew well that the teachings of these outside groups 
were spiritually destructive, and he understood that the driving force behind these two groups and the teachings of these two groups was not God, but an ungodly source. He knew that what drove the teaching and the thinking of these outside groups were the worldly principles, the elementary principles of the world, the demonic rulers and authorities in the unseen spiritual realm that do have an effect and an impact on the lives of those around us, especially those who don't know Christ. Last week we read through verse 15, <clears throat> but we didn't spend any time looking at the verse itself, so I want to come back to it today and take a little time to walk through it, because in verse 15, Paul reveals another work of Jesus at the cross that every believer should always be familiar with, that should always be at the forefront of the believer's mind. In verse 15, Paul noted that Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to an open shame by triumphing over them in him. Some of you may be reading from a translation that says something a little bit different, something like triumphing over them by the cross in verse 15, or triumphing over them by it, which is a reference to the cross. Either of these translations is honestly a better rendering and reading of the original text than what we read here in the ESV. And they better convey the point that Paul was making here in the verse as a whole. The cross was a place of spiritual victory and not a place of spiritual defeat. As the Net Bible Commentary notes, there is a sense of irony being conveyed by Paul in verse 15. The cross was often viewed as a place of defeat because the cross was, view, was, was a tool that was used to bring life to an end. So the cross was regularly seen as a place of defeat. Now these rulers and authorities of verse 15 that Paul spoke of, Paul's not speaking of earthly rulers and authorities. He's not speaking of human beings that have been put in charge of rule and authority over people in the world. Paul, in verse 15, when he speaks of these rulers and authorities, he is speaking of demonic rulers and authorities in the spiritual realm who have some authority and some control over people's lives, specifically those who don't know Christ. In a, in a spiritual sense, these demonic rulers, these demonic authorities that exist in the spiritual realm, when Jesus was brought to the cross, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, the cross to them would have been seen and viewed as a point of victory for them. They would have seen the death of Jesus as a defeat, but we come to verse 15 and we are reminded that that wasn't the case. There was no spiritual defeat of Jesus at the cross. The cross became a point of spiritual triumph, not spiritual defeat, because the death of Jesus disarmed the demonic rulers and authorities, taking from them the control they once had while putting them to an open and public shame. Because in the death of Christ, sin is dealt with, the control of the enemy is dealt with, the consequences of sin are dealt with, victory holy is won through the death of Christ at the cross and then ultimately in his resurrection. Simply put, the demonic rulers and authorities in the spiritual realm, which still exist to this day, have no authority or control over the believer in Jesus Christ because of what Jesus did at the cross. At the same time, the controlling power of sin, like we said, is broken in the lives of those who would trust in him. And so the believer is no longer under the rule of sin, nor are they under the control of demonic rulers and authorities. Their sin, past, present, and future, has been dealt with in full, once and for all, through Jesus at the cross. Still today, the life of every believer is subject to Jesus. If you have trusted in Christ, your life is subject to the rule and authority of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus indwells each and every believer through the presence of his Holy Spirit. And through faith in Jesus, the believer has been made spiritually whole. The believer has been made spiritually complete. So why is this worth knowing? Well, as we'll see throughout verses 16 through 23, 
when we know and understand what Jesus has accomplished for us, when we know and understand what Jesus has done through the sacrifice of his life on the cross, and we know and understand who we are and what we are in and through Jesus, as a believer in Christ, we are less likely to be coerced into adopting ungodly spiritual practices that have absolutely no spiritual value. When outside groups under the influence of demonic rulers and authorities judge believers as being spiritually incomplete for not following their religious practices. Look again at verses 16 through 19. Verses 16 and 17 address the teaching of the Judaizers of the day. Verse 18 addresses the teaching of the Gnostics. And verse 19 addresses both groups as a whole. Along with any other group that may claim one needs more than faith in Jesus in order to be right with God. And while outside groups may differ in the things that they teach, one thing that is common among all of these outside, unchristian, ungodly groups that exist, one thing that is common among all of them is that none of them have a connection to Jesus Christ. And we see this in verse 19. Neither the Gnostics nor the Judaizers held fast to the head, which is a reference to Jesus. As we saw early on in this letter, Jesus is the head of the church. He is the head of the body of Christ. And Paul used this anthropomorphic description of the body of Christ here in verse 19 to emphasize that every believer in Jesus is knit together. They are joined together as one through Jesus, the head of his body, the head of the church, the head of the body of Christ. But we also find in verse 19 that the body of Christ is spiritually nourished through Jesus. The body of Christ is nourished through the truth of God revealed through Jesus, and the body is, grows and matures spiritually through Jesus and the truth of God. Nothing apart from Jesus, no spiritual teaching that is contrary to what God has revealed through Jesus and his word brings spiritual nourishment or spiritual growth to the body of Christ. Only the truth of God brings spiritual growth and spiritual nourishment. So Paul once again reminded the Colossians that there is no spiritual benefit to adopting the teachings of the Judaizers or the Gnostics. No spiritual growth would come from adopting their practices. Now you couple this with what Paul said in verses 6 through 14. And the reality that every believer is spiritually complete through faith in Jesus Christ. And we find even more reason to resist and not embrace the spiritual teachings of ungodly groups that are outside of the Christian faith. Nothing good will ever come in your spiritual life from embracing spiritual teachings that are contrary to the truth of God. I cannot warn you strongly enough in that regard. Nothing good will ever come from embracing spiritual teachings that are contrary to the truth of God. I don't think it can be stated more plainly. Many of us already know this. Many of us already understand this. But it doesn't hurt to be reminded of it. Because false teaching has not gone away. False teaching is increasing continually. False teaching has not gone away. Ungodly people will continually use different means to lure believers into embracing their false teachings. And a method that is commonly used by outside groups, a, com a method that's been commonly used for centuries, is the passing of judgment and condemnation on anyone and everyone who does not adopt their spiritual teachings. We see that both among the Judaizers and the Gnostics. We see that they used such a ruse to try and garner the attention and entice the Colossians. We see, this in, we see this is inferred throughout verses 16 through 18 because when we look at verses 16 through 18, there's a couple of key phrases you may have noticed when we were reading through the text. Let no one pass judgment on you. And this other phrase, let no one disqualify you. A better translation and rendering of the text in verse 18 would be, let no one condemn you. Implicit in both of these statements was the means through which the Judaizers and the Gnostics would try to coerce the Colossians. Because the Colossians were predominantly Gentile. The Judaizers were predominantly Jewish. 
And they essentially believed that Gentiles needed to become Jewish plus have faith in Jesus in order to be right with God. Given that the Mosaic law was given to Israel and not given to the Gentiles, the Colossians would have been unfamiliar with the law. They certainly would not have been accustomed to adhering to the law. When the Judaizers saw these Gentile believers not observing the Jewish dietary laws, not observing the feasts that are drawn out in the law, not observing the Sabbath, the Judaizers would judge them as being estranged from God, implying they needed to adopt their beliefs, they needed to take on their practices in order to be sure that they were actually right with God. Now stop and think about that for a moment. Put yourself in the shoes of the Colossians. You've heard the gospel, you've trusted in Christ, but the Christian faith is still new to you. You're still young in the faith. You're still in those early stages growing in the faith, coming to know and understand what it means and what it looks like to live faithfully as a follower of Christ, learning how a Christian lives out their faith in the world. You're growing in the knowledge of the Lord as it's being taught to you, but then this other group comes along all of a sudden claiming to know how people can be in a right relationship with God. And they come along with judgment. And they come along with condemnation because you don't follow the same spiritual practices they observe. How susceptible to their condemning influence might they be? There's a good chance that many of the Colossians, because they were young in the faith, wondered whether the Judaizers, or Judaizers were right in what they were teaching and what they were saying. It's possible they wondered whether, the, whether they did need to do something more than just trust in Jesus. Because again, they're young in the faith. They're still learning. They're growing. They're experiencing this in real time. And this group has come along and they sound fairly convincing. They sound fairly authoritative. They seem fairly religious. They seem fairly close to God, and they're coming with judgment and condemnation to bring them into their fold. And chances are, some were wondering. And this is likely one of the reasons why Paul made it clear in verses 6 through 14 that the Colossians were spiritually complete through their faith in Christ and needed to do nothing more than trust in Jesus Christ alone. But the lack of spiritual understanding among both the Judaizers and Gnostics was another reason why the Colossians were to not allow either of these groups to pass judgment on them or condemn them for living by faith in Christ alone. In verse 17, Paul emphasized the, the Judaizers' lack of spiritual knowledge and understanding by noting that they did not understand that the law was a shadow of things to come. The law that they insisted everyone must follow in order to be right with God only served a temporary purpose. It served a temporary purpose as moral guardrails for Israel while always pointing people to Messiah who was to come. But the substance of the law belongs to Christ, meaning Jesus is the substance of the law because in him the law was fulfilled and upheld perfectly for all. And because Jesus fulfilled the law, people are no longer bound to the law. So adhering to the law would be of no spiritual gain. And to teach that obedience to the law as the Judaizers would do was contrary to what Jesus had taught. And it revealed quite clearly that the Judaizers did not have any true spiritual knowledge of God. Now just a quick side note. When an individual or a group willfully or continually teaches something that is contrary to what God has revealed through Jesus and his word, and they present their teachings as being essential for one to, to be made right with God, they are false teachers, and they should be noted for what they are. They are false teachers, and they are void of true spiritual understanding. Always. Always, always pay attention to what you are being taught. Don't let the world teach you theology. 
The Gnostics were no different than the Judaizers. What they taught was different, but on the whole, they were no different. They too lacked true spiritual knowledge. They, they too lacked true spiritual understanding of God. And even more so, the Gnostics incorporated ungodly mystical practices and life practices into their prescribed forms of worship. They insisted people live an ascetic life, which is to willfully practice severe self-discipline to abstain from all forms of pleasure. The idea was that living such a life, to, to live such a rigid, disciplined life, that you abstain from the pleasures of life or any sort of uh, indulgence in any type of pleasure whatsoever in this life would garner some form of favor with God. And they also taught that people needed to believe that, believe and worship angels and believe that they were mediators between God and men. And because the Gnostics saw angels as being mediators between God and men, they saw them in a hierarchical state, and they would argue and teach that some of the angels deserved to be worshipped by the people just as much as they worshipped God himself. None of this from the Gnostics was in line with what Jesus taught. None of it was in line with what God had revealed through his word. And in the latter half of verse 18, we find that the Gnostic teachings and practices were, in fact, influenced by ungodly sources, conjured up in the sinfulness of the minds of individuals. The Gnostic teachers claimed to have had visions. They, they claimed to have this deep spiritual insight in which their teachings were revealed to them, but they were certainly not visions from God because their teachings were contrary to the truth of God. So like the Judaizers, the Gnostics lacked true spiritual understanding and knowledge but they too would condemn the Colossians for only living by faith in Jesus and not adopting their spiritual practices. They would try to coerce them into joining them through their condemnation of them. And like the believers in Colossae, believers today should never allow judgment and condemnation to coerce them into accepting spiritual teachings or practices of anyone or any group, especially when their teachings and their practices are not founded in the truth of Jesus and the truth of God's word. Don't ever let someone use judgment and coercion to bring you under the bondage of ungodly spiritual teaching. Because to embrace and adopt what they insist upon is to buy a spiritual bill of goods that is of absolutely no value. And to embrace what they teach is to subject oneself to a worldly burden that God has not placed on those who belong to him. Look again at verses 20 through 23. In verse 20 through 22, Paul put forward a rhetorical question that emphasized the emptiness of spiritual teaching and practices that were void of Jesus. But it was a rhetorical question that would also lead the Colossians to fully consider the emptiness of such teachings in light of the fullness that they had found through faith in Jesus. And it's a question that should cause you and I to pause and consider whether we, in our own lives, have embraced empty spiritual teachings and practices that are void of Christ himself. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Paul was not suggesting that the Colossians had not died with Christ to the elemental spirits of the world. The phrase, if with Christ, is better understood as Paul saying, since with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world. The Colossians had died with Christ to these elemental spirits of the world when they trusted in Jesus at his death. They trusted in Jesus in his death on the cross. They were a new creation. They were no longer under the rule of sin. They were no longer under the control of demonic influence. And given that this was their reality now, in and through Christ, Paul was in turn telling the Colossians, don't live like those who pretend to know God but know nothing of him. Don't submit to ungodly regulations that have no spiritual value. Don't deny 
Don't deny yourself of things that God has not said you must refrain from with the hope that it will give you some sort of favor with him. As Norman Geisler rightly points out in his commentary, all of these rules and regulations put forward from the Judaizers and the Gnostics arose from personal guilt. Everything they taught arose from personal guilt. Personal guilt from sin in their lives that they were looking to assuage through obedience to their own religious constructs and self-imposed regulations. By keeping the law and exercising faith, the Judaizers were doing the same. They were hoping to cover all of their spiritual bases to ensure that they were right with God. Through the insistence on asceticism and other mystical practices, the Gnostics were hopeful that strict adherence to such rigid living would quell the fleshly desires and sinful living that produced the guilt that gripped them so. But their spiritual practices and modes for living were based on human precepts and on human teaching. None of their practices were rooted in truth. Sure, from the outside they appeared to be wise practices. Paul even noted that in verse 23. Their, their practices indeed had an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, referring to that strict denial of enjoying all pleasures in life. From the outside looking in, it appeared wise, and it still appears wise to many today. The, this living with self-imposed rules. It still appears wise to many today because there's this common assumption that if one will devote themselves to religious practices and deny themselves pleasures in life, then they will be able to quell sin in their life. That's one of the reasons Christians still to this day will impose rules upon themselves and rules upon other believers that God has not imposed on his own people. Like we noted last week, legalism in its simplest form is the imposing of rules and restrictions on the people of God that God himself has not imposed on his people. That is legalism in its simplest form and definition. And many of us are familiar with legalism because we've experienced it in our own lives. We may have had legalistic rules imposed on us by others. We may have imposed legalistic rules upon ourselves. We may have experienced both in our lives. And the common reason these rules were imposed was to keep Christians in line and to keep Christians from sin. But legalism is nefarious. There is absolutely no true piety in legalism at all. There's no piety in legalism because legalism is often accompanied with the belief that living by man-made imposed rules will make one a better Christian and earn them favor with God in some form or fashion. Legalism also leads people to adopting an if-then theology. If I do this, then God is beholden to do something for me. But the worst part about legalism is the fact that it denies the sufficiency and completeness of Christ's sacrifice on the cross for our sin, and it denies who Scripture says we are in and through Christ. Anyone here ever hear someone teach, don't drink alcohol and God will look favorably upon you, or something along those lines? How about don't watch television and you will live a more holy life? Or don't listen to secular music and you'll be a better Christian? Any of those sound familiar? Anyone ever live by those rules or live with that kind of mentality? I've heard all of those statements. I've heard all of those instructions more times than I can count and more times than I would ever like to remember in the course of my life. I've even found myself living by these rules at times in my life, fully believing that I would be a better Christian if I lived by these rules all the time. It's a destructive thing to adopt a legalistic mentality. It is spiritually destructive. These rules all have in common. They're all man-made. 
every one of them is a man-made rule. A man-made rule imposed on people with the idea that obedience to them will lead to greater spiritual maturity and quell various indulgences of the flesh. And they all produce a very faulty if-then theology leading people to think that God is beholden to them because of something they have done for him. But there's no need to create and impose such rules to quell sin in our lives. There's no reason to create and impose such rules to assuage guilt of sin because our sin has been dealt with. Our guilt has been removed. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Nor is there a need to create and impose such rules to keep Christians from sin because the indwelling Holy Spirit leads the believer in truth and faithful living. Nor will any man-made rule quell the sinful desires of the flesh, because you cannot make your flesh better. You cannot make your flesh better. And to think that you can, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, is pride and arrogance. And to create and impose such rules for oneself or for others as a Christian is to claim the name of Christ, but live no differently than the Judaizers or the Gnostics that Paul was opposing throughout this letter. And I think that's one of the things that Paul was trying to drive home with the Colossians here in this passage. The world under the control and influence of demonic rulers and authorities will tell you that you can make it on your own. The world will tell you you can forego Jesus, do X, Y, and Z, and earn God's favor in a right relationship with him. The world will tell you that you need to do more than just trust in Jesus in order to be right with God. But what do the scriptures say? Who and what are believers in light of what the scriptures say? <coughs> As a believer in Christ, you are fully forgiven of your sin, free from the control of sin in your life, free from the control of demonic rulers and authorities in this world, free from the judgment and condemnation of religious groups that have no spiritual knowledge of God whatsoever, though they appear to be spiritually wise from the outside looking in. Simply put, the scriptures say that every believer in Jesus Christ is spiritually complete. Nothing more needs to be done. You are complete in and through him. And if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, that is who you are. And that is what you are. You are spiritually complete and free to live for Jesus in the grace and freedom of Christ by faith because he has done all that needed to be done in order for you to be right with the Father by trusting in him and him alone. And so my challenge for every believer is to always remember who you are and what you are in and through Christ. And I challenge you to live in freedom. To live in freedom by faith because as a believer in Christ you are spiritually complete and you are free. And Father, we give you thanks for the freedom that we have in and through your Son. We thank you that all of the work has been done. We thank you that through faith in Christ, we are made right with you. We thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit to guide and direct us and to lead us into what is right and true to lead us into living lives that are honoring to you. Father, may we walk in the spiritual freedom that you have given to us. May we never burden ourselves or others with rules that you have not put upon us yourself. And may we always be mindful of what we are accepting as true. <clears throat> 
may we always look at what we are being taught in light of what you have revealed in and through your word so that we may always walk in your truth. Father, I pray today for those who don't know Christ that today would be the day that they would come to know him and come to know life and come to know spiritual freedom. Father, we again give you thanks and praise. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.